Guys, I'm really uh, delighted to welcome to the podcast someone I've been reading, uh, well, for a long time now with admiration. It's uh, Mark Bauerlein, who's a senior editor at First Things, where he hosts a podcast. He's also Professor Emeritus of English at Emory University. Uh, he's written for the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, and he's written a number of important books, including The Dumbest Generation, and now more recently, The Dumbest Generation Grows Up. Uh, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Uh, you are a, a veteran, I would have to say, of the of the culture wars, and you have sort of you've seen the culture wars in the place where they seem to have been almost incubated, namely the American University. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how things changed over your career? In other words, if you take a snapshot of when you first went into teaching English to when you got out, what was the difference? I was, uh, I finished in 1988. I got my, my doctorate at UCLA in 1988. I came out, I got a job. I taught for as a lecturer for a year at UCLA. Then I went, got a job at Emory University in Atlanta in an English department, which was growing, had a lot of money, uh, a lot of hiring going on. I was a, a carbon copy academic in the humanities. I was ferociously liberal. I was actually a militantly atheist. I, I, I would never even consider e even, even taking seriously a Republican candidate for office because Republicans were either greedy or stupid. Take your pick. And actually, one of the topics in, in those years, as you remember quite well, were the, the academic canon wars, the culture wars. I actually remember you did an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal uh, about how uh, pop culture, Westerns, were now really supplanting. Uh, Western civilization and and great literature, and we all took notice of what you and a few others were were. I mean, Alan Bloom and Roger Kimball, Dinesh D'Souza, the illiberal education book. Those actually had uh, a real impact on the humanities in higher education. They rippled through, and the impact was nervousness. Okay, you made us nervous. We felt deeply discomfited. We didn't take your ideas seriously because we were the smart ones. We knew better. We, we were the ones who were there credentialed and we were tenured, tenured or getting tenure. So we were in charge. We knew, but, but these, these, these arguments by these people like, like Kimball and D'Souza, they were, just, they were just an irritant. And what gradually came to me was over the course of the 90s, as I saw these identity politicians in departments, who were hard left. And there may be only two or three of them in a department of 25. Those two or three were able to cow and silence and intimidate the other 22 more or less reasonable moderate liberals in the room. And this is something that I thought, what is wrong here? These people are destroying civilization as we know it, as we understand it, as we teach it. And I started sort of reacting to that. And then I started actually reading people like you more carefully, uh, David Horowitz and others and think, you know, these, these people are kind of right about what's going on. And that actually pushed me to the right. And it's one of those things where you start moving and then you move a little farther and things open up. And I read classic books like Witness, you know, Whitaker Chambers and uh, started reading the Weekly Standard and and some of the other conservative publications, the New Criterion. And I, I simply found myself becoming a cultural conservative and realizing I always was actually an education conservative. I believed in Western civilization. I believed in great books. And seeing my colleagues just kind of letting that slip away, I thought, what are you, are you people decadent? Are you just corrupt or are you just cowards? My goodness. And that pushed me over to the right. I went to work for the, the W's administration for a couple of years. And it just sort of kept, kept moving me to, to the right, reading more things. And part of what I saw was education was, humanities education was deteriorating. The popular culture was deteriorating in terms of maintaining a little bit of high culture, high literature in there. And I was seeing it in my students. And then I saw the digital age hit them. They all become addicted to those little screens. They were walking around on Facebook and there were all these cheerleaders saying the young are going to lead us into the 21st century. Look at all the innovative improvisational things 
they're doing with this Facebook stuff and now this iPhone and the texting. And that's why I wrote the first book, The Dumbest Generation. The first title, the first full title is How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future or Don't Trust Anyone Under 30. Uh, and, and so uh, that warned, we're letting 15 year olds here go into their rooms and case themselves in screens, which are just purveying youth culture and peer pressure all the time. The grown up issues of history, politics, religion, great books are not penetrating into their, into their lives. They have the tools now to shut things off. I didn't when I was 15. I'm not better than they were. I just didn't have the equipment to do what they were doing. And I warned, they're, gonna, they're stupefied now. They are going to grow up and they are not being prepared for citizenship in an open society, in a free republic. And here we are now, Dinesh, we're 15 years past it. How are the millennials doing? Well, they're in middle age. Depression is up. Uh, uh, anxiety is up. Narcissism is up. Who would have thought that they would become narcissists when we handed them a tool that where they could carry 250 pictures of themselves around in their pockets at all times? Uh, suicide is up. They're not getting married. They're not forming families. They still want to live with their friends, like those 90s TV show uh, heroes, friends. Uh, friends are very, very important to them. They were said to be so tolerant, so progressive. They helped elect our first African-American president. And now they rate more intolerant than any older generations. They actually have a vindictive sense of their fellow citizens. They have high social mistrust. And when they see an injustice going on, even a microaggression, they want that culprit to pay. So they'll sign a petition with 2,000 others to get a stranger fired for telling some dumb sexist joke on, on, on Twitter. That's where the dangerousness is coming in. They are illiberal citizens. As you wrote, they got an illiberal education. The screens, the digital tools reinforced that illiberalism. I mean, remember, Nanesh, when they were 15 in the bedroom and they're on Facebook and one of the Facebook contacts writes something that he doesn't like, unfriend, you're out. <laughs> they've been canceling for 15 years. Wow. They, they, they've been blocking. You, you could just block someone. A news feed is coming in. You don't like that. You don't like a story. It, it's out. So you could you could fabricate the reality that was all affirming. It was the daily me. Remember that term? The daily me. And so they never had to face a contrary opinion, a disagreeable outlook. And what they've done is transfer the norms, the mores of that 15 year old bedroom into the workplace into the public square. So I shouldn't have to listen to this. This is offensive. And not only will I just walk away, but you have to shut up. <laughs> this is where we are now. Hey, Mark, so. you know what? I, this is why this is such a fantastic interview is it makes my life unbelievably easy. I go, hello. You go for eight <laughs> minutes straight. Uh, we, then we take Academics. a break. Then I go, hello again. You go for another eight minutes. <laughs> but this, you know, you've said so many interesting and provocative things. Let's take a pause. When we come back, I'm going to actually just probe you on a couple of things you said. And this is just fascinating. I'll shorten, I'll shorten my response. Uh, no problem. Yes. We'll be right back. <laughs> 